Hey, good morning, everybody. Good morning, good morning, good morning. I hope you all are doing well. Welcome to Pillow Talk with Dr. Boyce and Dr. Alicia Watkins. My name is Dr. Boyce Watkins, and I'm here laying against my pillow with my lovely wife, Dr. Alicia. How are you doing today, babe? I'm doing well. How are you doing this morning? Doing good, doing good. You got your sleepy voice. I do, because I am sleepy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we went to the gym this morning, and, um, you know, we, we try to keep our beach bodies together, and I was in there pumping iron and all that. And When are we going to the beach, though? I know. We don't go to the beach. What's the point of the beach body? I love if you don't going go to, to the beach. beach. Yeah, yeah. Well, you the know, the beach is calling, boys. <laughs> I know, I know. Well, you know, I tell you what, y'all. If you're not, I don't know how many of y'all are fifty yet or close to it, but if you are, you got to stay in shape. You got to keep working out. I saw something today where the doctor, the doctor was talking about the importance of walking. He said that people don't stop walking because they're old; they get old because they stop walking. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yeah, 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 yeah. If you if you don't use it, you lose it. There we go. So yeah. don't forget y'all, health is wealth. All right. And, and um, but anyway, let us know. Give us a quick yes if you can hear us. Let us know if the audio is coming through okay. I see my name is Corey and El Hodge. First ones in here. They, they I tell you what, these brothers, people like you, El Hodge, and my name is Corey. I just want to say I appreciate y'all so much because I I always see you and I respect you so much. And uh Denise Bryan is in here from Chicago. All right, shout out the city you're from and Abdur. And if you don't know about Pillow Talk, Pillow Talk is a podcast where my wife and I get together. We're both professors. My, I'm a professor of finance. My wife has her doctorate in social work, and she's also a licensed therapist. And so we we like to chime in on conversations in the Black community in a way that will help us gain deeper insights into the world. And I'm going to tell you, everybody has been talking about Wendy Williams. Um, uh, <laughs> how? First of all, let me ask everybody in here, uh, as you hit the thumbs up button, how many of y'all been watching this crazy doc? Yes, in the chat. Uh, Yolanda and Ernie uh, out of Philly. I see you, uh, Vita. Good morning to you, Vita. Uh, so, so uh, Akeem out of Oakland. Are y'all watching this Wendy Williams documentary? It's, it's kind of crazy. It's... Yeah, it's a two day. It's a, yesterday was the last day of the two day special. It's like a documentary. That's my understanding. It was a two day special. And boys, did you watch all of it? I think you got bits and pieces of it. It was hard for you to sit through it. It was. It was because that's not the Wendy Williams I knew. Like, mm -hmm. I, you know, I know Wendy. Like, I was on her show. I think I was on the Wendy Williams experience when she was on radio. I was on that show probably four or five times. And then later on, I was on the Breakfast Club a few times. And that's. broken down debilitated wendy i it, it bothers me honestly because i have i had so much respect for her and i still do i mean you know just as far as who she what she represented for radio i think she was damn good at what she did and just to see her kind of break down and to have it happen in public and on a documentary i i, I was mad honestly yeah i wonder um if it has something to do with the fact that she needed money mm. um because it just made sense because um, the state took over as her guardian, financial guardian. Mm, really? The state okay. took over her, all of her money, all of her finances. I'm not certain how that works. Do you have any idea how that works? Like, how is she paying her bills? What's going on? I don't know. Well, you know. She probably has to get permission, right? Yeah, I mean, I don't, I mean, She's, you're the, you're the, social, declared, you're the social worker. You're supposed to. She uh, was declared incompetent. Okay. I'm not certain about the rules of New York State <laughs> regulations in terms what of... What about Illinois? I mean, have you ever seen cases like that? Or just in social... No, I haven't. And I know you work in hospice care. I have not like seen that. cases like that. Really? Okay. No. Um, okay. I know that in... Yeah, I do have a contract with a hospice company. And I know that you have power of attorney for your health and power of attorney for your finances. But that's when... And, you know, she probably would need that. She probably would need that mm, okay. because she doesn't seem competent. She doesn't seem competent. Well, you know, yeah. um, when I when I saw what was going on, I, I reached out to a friend of mine who worked next to Wendy for many years, and and I just said, "Are you seeing this crap on TV?" And and she said, "Yeah, it's terrible." And we we both hate it. We both just it's just kind of it's. It, we, it, I think the big question was, who let this happen? And who put her out here like this? Who agreed to this? Yeah. Well, yeah. it couldn't have been Wendy Williams. 
<laughs> well, she doesn't look like somebody who's making her own decisions. Well, she can't. I, I think she's. it has been declared that she cannot make her own decisions. Mm. And I th and from last night, they um because I watched it. <laughs> last night they interviewed her family members and it was very emotional. Mm. I mean, you could tell that they sincerely really loved her, really care for her. But um, she Wendy Williams is an adult who's under the care of the state, and so no one has to tell anybody what's going on. Mm. So they're not. I think the whole family's been shut out, and so her own family members have no say in what's going on with her, with Wendy mm. Williams. And it's almost like they removed her from her family and she's under the care of who God knows who. Well, she, I saw the publicist and I saw some guy that would almost look like a bodyguard. Yeah, that publicist was very disappointing personally because Wendy Williams has an addiction, straight up. She's a straight up alcoholic. Okay. And the publicist really minimized the fact that um, she was an alcoholic. She's like, yeah, Wendy Williams, she drinks. I mean, she's been in rehab I don't know how many times, and her publicist is sitting there saying, yeah, she has a drink or two, but she knows when to stop and all of that. It's like the publicist is absolutely enabling her. Mm. I, I, I just don't think, like in terms of like integrity, I don't think I could work for somebody um, with an addiction like that and be part of a team of people that supports that, that would support that, manage that. Like, that's just something I, I wouldn't even want someone um, under those circumstances to, I wouldn't even be employed by someone under those circumstances. Like, it would just be against my whole entire <laughs> ethics, mm. <laughs> personally. Wow. Well, yeah. by, well, by the way, everybody, if you just came in, uh, my name is Dr. Boyce Watkins. This is my wife, Dr. Alicia Watkins. You're listening to Pillow Talk. This is a podcast where we get together and discuss topics in the Black community that we think professors can chime in on, and we'd like to elevate the conversation and help you gain some insights. Uh, if you haven't done so yet, could you please hit the thumbs up button, thumbs up, share, subscribe. Also, don't forget this podcast is on Spotify. If you look up my name, Boyce Watkins, uh, we just put all of our content under the same brand, uh, the Dr. Boyce Breakdown, but Pillow Talk is part of that. So if you want to follow us on Spotify or Apple, just look up my name and you'll find it there. Uh, also, if you'd like a free copy, I've, I have a book called Financial Lovemaking. If you'd like a free copy of that book, just text the word love to 87948. Also, Dr. Alicia will send you uh, some support information uh, from her coaching business. She is a licensed therapist and a full professor of social work, and she sees tons and tons of clients. So if you'd like to learn more about what she does, you can go to coachingwithdralicia.com. Okay, so let's get back to Wendy Williams. All right, so we were talking about Wendy and what I see here. Now, one thing I that stuck out to me just as a financial guy, and I know you and I have talked about this with you working in hospice care, is the possibility of financial abuse. Uh, now, I've heard all kinds of stuff. And again, you can't lean on rumors one way or the other, but there's conversations about her son using her money. But yeah. then, but then, but you know, and maybe that's possible. Who have no stake in her, right? Who did not come out of her body, you know? And I'm thinking. No, I think that, I think the issue with the son, uh, that is problematic. If you if you take over somebody's financial estate, you don't pocket <laughs> hundreds of thousands of dollars. You don't pocket that money. That is not your money to take for your own personal use. I mean, okay. he is an adult. You they're not going to give you okay. They're not going to give you permission to take over someone's financial estate if you yourself is in financial dire circumstances is that is that the, the situation with the son or how did they present the son in the documentary well i th you know what actually he was he presented as someone who was genuinely concerned for his mother okay but i think it's like like the parent child dynamic that was there i think that once you take over a parent's estate you don't take any of that money in that estate and pocket it and i don't maybe what, he just didn't about, realize what about some kind of maintenance fee like if if you're if you're managing so like like when I, I know when i die and i leave my estate i expect the person who is the executor and or the person who's kind of managing things trustee and all that to get some compensation for the trouble that it takes to do that yeah that that is true but outside of that you don't take you just don't use that money for your own personal interest even if that person tells you to do it because if they were in their right mind they'd have control of their money anyway 
And so I know maybe I'm thinking he just didn't understand his role in terms of, you know, being someone in charge of her estate. And that's different from being an executor, you know, being power of attorney. It sounded like it was power of attorney of her finances. That's different from being executor. How old is her son? Do you remember? Um, I don't know, but he's an adult. Is he over 30? Um, I'm not certain. I don't okay. I don't know how old that son is. He's a young guy. Okay. Um, and he's very concerned for his mom. I mean, the interview was really emotional. Um Can somebody Google that for us? I'd yeah. like to know how old this son <laughs> we is. We need to research it's it. Because remember, you know, the brain's not even fully developed until you're twenty five. And I'm not gonna I'm not gonna throw the son under the bus without full, you know, information and knowledge. I'm really not just so much looking at the sun. Because, you know, honestly, I'm okay with my kids benefiting from my money. Mm -hmm. You know, even, you know, I married you. Your kids, you know, are my kids in my mind. So I don't mind them getting something. You know, and, and then he's, okay. But so if much. you're incompetent, here's the thing. If you're declared incompetent, you can't, you know, to go along with that, you just can't take somebody's finances and just spend it just on yourself no you know I, what I mean I, like I, I don't think that that I don't think that that's I don't you know that's not part of your responsibilities you take care of their personal expenses and you know whatever the fee is it has to be something reasonable now apparently it was deemed unreasonable because the to court took back control of it okay so, you know so okay. clearly there was some um, something mm. going on that wasn't the way it was supposed to be okay so the son is 23 so he's he's just a kid. Oh gosh! Right. So he was so, probably not the right person for that. Yeah. Okay. So does he have other? Does she have other kids? Besides it sounds him? like that's her only child. Okay. She only had that one child. Okay. And then there was a sister. There was uh, Wendy Williams' sister who really seems like should have been the person in charge of her finances, who seemed to be actually concerned. Wendy Williams also had a niece who was like a like a goddaughter to her who was a niece, seems like that person um, was very concerned. I mean, it just seemed, and she also has a father. Her father was around. So, I mean, it. she had great family and great support system around her, but it was just almost like, because they all lived in Miami and she lives in, um, in New York. So it just seems like the distance played a part in what was happening. You live in two separate states. And then um, Wendy Williams has her team of people that she pays. And those were the people that seems to be really influencing her on the day-to-day -day basis. And whoever was her bodyguard, good grief, this man spent a lot of time, like, <laughs> finding bottles of vodka and pouring it down the drain and going to restaurants and telling people, hey, could you not put alcohol in this drink? <laughs> because she, he was saving her from herself because she could not help it. She had to drink. And there was a moment, there was another scene in it where the publicist, kind of get on my nerves a little bit, but the publicist, she had to get one of those, I don't know what this is, you know, like one of those vapes. It's called a blue vape she was locate, trying to get. So she sends her publicist into the store to get this vape or whatever. She gets the vape and she's like, that's not the right one. So the publicist goes back into the store like four or five times. She's going back and forth in the store because Wendy Williams can't keep her. Her mind is gone. It was just really bizarre. And then she's like, wait, go to go to the Wendy Williams show, which is not the Wendy Williams show. Someone else, I think it's Sherry Shepard now take, took her spot. She's like, go to the Wendy Williams show. It's right around the corner from the Wendy Williams show. They go in the to the Wendy Williams around the corner. It's the exact same vape store. She was Wendy Williams was thinking it was a different vape store. Like at that point, okay. the the documentary people were like, okay, we're done for the day. Like I can't go around in circles with this lady. I am done. Like okay. the cameras were off. So I think that was a point where I was just like, what are these people doing? Okay, with so I want I want to get like more clinical assessments to from you as well, not just well, what that's was, just I, I want to understand like from your perspective, because I want to give a perspective too, because I know Wendy, right? And I know, and I know. Yeah, but that's a clinical right, but, perspective to tell you that she's not well. Right, right. Her cognition is right. is not together. Right, right. So, so I want to I want to ask you more about that, like just because I know you taught that class on addictions and, um, and also you you you're a social worker, so I imagine as a social worker you run into a lot of cases like this, and also I can say. You know, I it, it, once you once you hit that, I want to actually talk about my personal experience of dealing with Wendy and why 
the documentary kind of pissed me off. Like it kind of it irritated me because, you know, I remember when I went on the Wendy Williams show on the radio, I remember feeling like I was intimidated actually the first time I went on there because I thought, cause I'd, I'd seen her fighting with Whitney Houston back in the day. And, and I knew she was kind of the queen of New York. Like her show was the number one radio show on the planet or in at least in all of America in the United States at that time. And I remember feeling about her she you know honestly tasha k who you and i both know i'm actually doing stuff on tasha k's thing today um tasha That's today k, yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. tasha k honestly i i'd be curious to know what tasha k thinks about wendy because tasha's kind of like wendy in the sense of you know like kind of messy it's a but, modern day wendy williams right, i think right yeah. right somewhat without all of the out addiction <laughs> right right De mm -hmm. definitely messy but yeah. but brilliant in their own way and um and, and both of them it's really ironic like i felt when i talked to tasha it reminded me of talking to wendy in the sense that like you have this person that has this big personality on the outside and the gossip and the drama but there's a respect for intelligence like i don't know if wendy i'm not sure i gotta look it up but i could have swore her father was a college professor and i remember every time i went on that show i always felt respected i felt like i was dealing with a true professional like her, the, the interviews always went smoothly i did i hated going on the tom Jordan morning show because those interviews were just terrible they would just they would rush you through the conversation they would ask you crazy questions that they that they said they were different from the ones that they said they were going to ask it was it was not fun whereas going on the wendy show every time i went on there her and charlamagne were just the best radio team I'd ever seen, you know? So to see Wendy go out like that just bothers me. And I also think about the ex-husband she had, Kevin Hunter. And I know Kevin, you know, he doesn't have the best reputation, to be honest with you. A lot of people have a lot of crazy things to say about him. But it almost seemed like at that time, Kevin was a protector for her, right? And he was a protector for her when she went on her show. And uh, and and now that protector is kind of gone. And I don't see her as a person that has protection anymore. And I'm just wondering if that could be happening here. Well, I think that she has a lot of loss, remember? she She lost her mother. Uh, at the same time, she lost her TV show, and then also at the same time, she loses her husband, and she loses control of her finances. So I think it just, all of those things all together played a toll on her. It's too overwhelming for her to be able to connect to, and so there you go, you connect to your addiction as a, as a way of coping. And they did mention in the show, in the documentary, they mentioned, you know, you, you need therapy. <laughs> and she's like, uh, I'm not going to therapy. So she's not willing to go to therapy. She's not willing to face what's going on and she's not willing to get better. And then you start to think like, okay, self-determination at some point, you know, if she wants to drink herself down to nothing, I mean, who, who you really, how, where do you step in and say, stop doing it? Do you force her to stop it? That's happened before. But I really do think the change comes from you wanting to change. She has to want to change. She has to want to get better. And that's the biggest thing with addictions. You cannot take somebody to a drug treatment program and force them to change. They've got to want to do it. It's the worst thing, you know, you to see a loved one go down like that, see a loved one um, have that sort of addiction and you have to just remove yourself from it because they have to want to get better. You can't make somebody get better. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Addiction, you know, it's I'm, a tough thing. I'm going to tell you, I, I don't, I, I, I really wish, I really wish I could persuade more black people, more of us to talk about what drugs and alcohol do to our community. There's so much tragedy. I mean, if you think about just again, some of the most epic, one of the most epic, experiences in all of radio history everybody should go look it up was when wendy was arguing with whitney houston <laughs> wendy a, that her. was fabulous that, that was just so funny because whitney <laughs> wasn't the one right right to but, go but, right mm -hmm. right but if you think about it right it's sad because the two drug addicts both of them were affected by <laughs> right both of them were affected by drugs and yeah and it's unfortunate like we we will lose these interesting iconic people you know two drugs or two alcohol and nobody sits down and says okay as a, as a community as a family why don't we talk about drugs and just have a, a no tolerance policy on it? that's what china did china was having so many tragedies from drugs and opium and all that they said no we don't want this in our country we don't want this in our people whereas i think that we just kind of things bad things happen and we watch people fall and we just kind of say well oh, i guess i guess jesus didn't bless them enough or whatever i'm praying for you girl but it's like no you know we need to really talk about drugs I mean, yeah, I don't think. Like I, mm -hmm. Go ahead. You were gonna... Also, say stories like this are what 
kept me from ever trying drugs in the first place. Like, you know what, you know what actually got me to like have a zero interest policy when it came to drugs? When I watched Lady Sings the Blues. <laughs> That's like, an old movie. movie. Yeah. Billy, when Billy D. Williams was trying to get, I guess, uh, Billy Holiday off drugs or whatever was going on in that movie. I was five or six. I don't remember everything. It was but Diana I, Ross. Diana <laughs> Ross. Yeah. I remember watching that and seeing this lady. Like at that time, I think there's something like about mothers that's like that we hold in high esteem. Like that's my mama, right? So when I saw her, I saw my mama. And just to see and imagine my mama slung over the toilet, like with a needle in her arm. That just that image just bothered me as a little kid, and I remember feeling like drugs are horrible. Look at what I mean, you know. And and at the, and I formed that in my head when I was seven, eight, nine, or ten. And then my father, my father uh, had a heroin addiction, the one that raised me. But then my other father also had a drug addiction. That's why he wasn't in my life, right? And my father that overcame the heroin addiction, he would give me real life lessons about drugs. He would show me people friends of his that were doing really well and they got involved in drugs and everything fell apart they lost their family lost their money lost everything and i remember thinking i don't want that to happen to me right so i just kind of feel like as a community if we look at what drugs have done to the black community you know the crack epidemic with cia cocaine import agency and everything else i just kind of think as black families we should talk about it more no i think i, I mean i agree with you um but i want to add to it i think that um, we have to deal with some of the issues of why people use drugs. Why do people find this way of escape? And again, we've talked about this before. It's just like any addiction. I mean, workaholics, that's an addiction. You you get into your job and you work. It's more acceptable addiction for a lot of people. It's It's culturally acceptable, but workaholics <laughs> have some of those same issues where they're not dealing with some immediate issues that are going on inside of them, and they take it out in other different ways that are more acceptable. So, yeah, drugs is terrible, but if you want to get rid of drugs, you have to get rid of the reason why people feel like they need to use drugs to escape. So you're talking about like healing, like healing from trauma, things like that, right? Well, I mean, healing from trauma, yeah, that's great. It's a good catchword, but it's just, yes, healing from trauma, but it's connecting with how you feel because drugs will disconnect you from how you actually feel because it's so overwhelming. It's too overwhelming. It's too painful. And you relieve that pain by using addictions. Mm. And drugs is just one part of an addiction. Mm -hmm. There's many different ones. And alcoholism, alcohol is, is legal. Mm -hmm. It's illegal. I mean, well, how are you going to get rid of alcohol? It's it's not illegal in this country. Yeah. So Well, I would say just because it's legal, you know, doesn't mean you have to do it, right? Like, I, I never, even though I knew I could always walk in a liquor store, to this day, I don't feel comfortable going in a liquor store. Even if I'm going in there with somebody else to get something for other people, I just kind of, I walk in, I still have this weird feeling where i'm like oh wait I'm, am i old enough to be in here but I, i'm 50 i'm of course i'm old enough but at the same time i i like that i like that about myself that i still am almost like a virgin when it comes to like walking in the liquor store grabbing a bottle or whatever and i and it makes me feel better as a man like i like the fact that i married you we got three kids and i talk to the children and individually about about alcohol and since i said that's why you don't see me walking around here drinking all the time because because I don't want to be that man. I don't want to be the kind of man, that, the men that I saw and the men that they became mm -hmm. when they had, when they were all liquored up and all that. They, you know, you, your breath stinking, you're saying stuff that you, you're going to regret. Yeah, so that's you know. being drunk. So drinking and being drunk are two separate things. Those are two separate things. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, like, just so many examples of us going over the line. And, and my trauma was growing, going through the 90s where black men, all around me were going getting sent to prison and one common theme i picked oh, up i know okay. i picked up on patterns when i was young I remember the mass incarceration epidemic joe biden when he incarcerated millions of black men um i remember the common theme i picked up on in college was i said a lot of these tragedies are happening at the club when people have been drinking and mm, yeah and somebody yeah. gets an attitude with the bouncer the bouncer puts somebody out he goes to the car gets a gun i can't tell you how many times i've heard stories like that and i and, wow. and, and i literally know a couple of guys who just got out of prison in their 50s for things that happened in the early 90s that involved liquor the in the club <laughs> right so oh, wow so, yeah so it's it's a lot it's just drinking irresponsibly 
It's um, it's not connecting with how you feel. It's using this um, to escape, you yeah. know, to escape from very painful things instead of facing it. Yeah. yeah, it's a whole lot of going on. Yeah, yeah. Like I, I even feel like even when you talk about addictions, and now you're the the addiction expert, so I definitely defer to you on that 100. percent But, but you know, if I have a work a workaholic addiction, sure, it's not perfect, right? It's, you're you are disconnecting from the pain. You're distracting yourself, right? It seems right. But, but that's to me. Or if I have an addiction, still to, connected to depression I, I and anxiety. It. I get it. I mm-hmm. get it. Right. But, or, but if or if I form an addiction to running. That isn't gonna kill me the way an addiction to drugs will. Yeah, right? addiction. All addictions aren't great. Right. Like, there's nothing wrong with running, but you just can't run to extreme, right? I yeah. mean, that that gets True. into like eating disorders. Mm. Um, True. Yeah, it's a type. Some people run. It's like a purge. Mm. They want to purge, so it's like bulimic. <laughs> people just run all the time and anorexia and exercise. That's what a lot of men 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 do that a lot. I want to lift have, weights and stuff. I want to form an addiction to kissing you on the lips every morning. <laughs> why, why, and that's why, great. Why? That's great until it I, gets to be too I much. I got an addiction to you. I'm going to make my lips chap. You know, love is, love is an addiction. Love is an addiction, too. Yes, it is. I mean, it, it triggers the same part of your body, in your brain. Oh, and that's so bad, right? Yeah. Well, you know, people talk about um, addictions with a K. <laughs> Get it? Oh, boys. <laughs> boys. <laughs> you know what? I really do wonder about that. When I, we did we did our, um, I did my first panel last night. It was fun. Oh, with Other yeah. therapists. It was so great. And I, I, I really wondered if that was an addiction with a K. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? Uh, you're talking about uh, who the F did I marry? Yes. Yeah, yeah, the yeah, Tessa. Yeah. yeah, you all did a great uh, panel last did night. Did we do it? I, did you see it? Did you get to look at it? Yeah, yeah. And by the way, I'm going to share clips of that. If anybody wants to follow me on Instagram, my Instagram is Dr. Boyce Finance. And I'm going to share clips. And I know you'll share clips on your Instagram, which is Coaching with Dr. Alicia. And it's on flynewbeandqueentv.com. But what Alicia did, that I, and I, and I want to mention this so everybody can go take a look, is she gathered a bunch of therapists to analyze this big, Big 50 part series a woman did, which is turned out to be bigger than the Cat Williams interview. If you add, oh, up it's all amazing. She did such a great job telling the story. She yeah. laid it out and then what? Wait, was... wait, wait. Let me tell them what it's called. Okay. It's called, it's called Who the F Did I Marry? Who the F Did I Marry? But mm-hmm. go ahead. Yeah. And it's like you get to like, it's like episode 21 where you're just like, whoa. It's like it turns a corner. Like she really. Reveals it. <laughs> she does a really good job. We're going to do a part two next Sunday. We're going to talk a little bit more about psychopathy and um, Legion. Legion is the husband. That's not his real name, but um, we're going to talk about psychopathy, how to, how to spot a Legion. And then I'd also want to do another um, episode on who are the type of people they get caught up into Legion spell because not all women. There's some. There's some women or some people. Actually, I shouldn't put gender to it, but there's some people who are really good at seeing through that BS. But there are some people, based on their personality and their temperament, that can easily be caught into something like that. But we'll talk about it on the show. Yeah, well, you yeah. know, um, and by the way, everybody, if you want to actually hear uh, Alicia with the other therapists. Um, analyze who the F did I marry, um, just text the word love to 87948. If you text the word love to 87948, we'll also send you our Black Love Challenge. I'll send you a free copy of our book, uh, Financial Love Making, and, and et cetera. But we'll also text out the link to that uh, discussion. I think you will really enjoy it because you can learn a lot. I was listening to one of your therapist friends. I don't know mm-hmm. the person's name, but she said something that I've actually said before. She she, she mentioned um, mirroring, the technique of mirroring and how yes. people that want to deceive you uh, in a relationship, they'll mirror you or they'll pick up on, I think she said micro signals or something that you mm-hmm. said. Like if they say micro face, facial expressions and it, yeah. 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 Like if you, like if they bring up marriage and they could tell you get excited about marriage, then they'd be like, okay, I can, I'm going to talk about marriage mm-hmm. because that's going to, I'm going to sell her this dream. And you know what it, what it made me think about was I told you about that story years ago about a guy who um, all his fraternity brothers were in shock because he was like this big chubby guy, but he had all these girlfriends. 
And they said, man, how you get all these women? How you get all these girls just doing whatever you want? And, and that's exactly what he said. He, he literally, here's exactly how he said it. Don't get offended by how he said it. I'm just going to, he said, sell a whole dream, man. Just sell a whole dream. That's how, <laughs> that's how he said it. He, so basically he was like, if you just sell, if you, you know, if, if, if a person wants a fairy tale, you give them the fairy tale. If it, cause some people will pick a fake fairy tale over something that is real and honest. Yeah. You know, and that and that'll get you in trouble every time. Yeah. And even, you know, Tessa even admits, I mean, she's so um transparent and authentic in how she um talks about where she herself went wrong. I mean, she's just like, I this is like red flag number one thousand that I ignored. <laughs> she mm. just goes on and talks about it. I thought it was really interesting. Yeah, yeah. 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 So anyway, if yeah, if you guys text the word love to eight seven nine four eight. I will text you out the link a little bit later on today. So, um, so as far as Wendy, I'm, I'm going to make my final statement on this. And if y'all could hit the thumbs up button, thumbs up, share, subscribe. And by the way, you're watching Pillow Talk with Dr. Boyce and Dr. Alicia Watkins. My name is Dr. Boyce Watkins. This is my wife, Dr. Alicia Watkins. And, and our today's topic was the Wendy Williams documentary and yeah, what's going on with that. And then just generally how to deal with this, you know, and things with substance abuse and, and uh, financial abuse that can occur when a person uh, starts to uh, deteriorate in terms of health. Uh, also, I think that there's even a point part we, we haven't had a chance to really get to, because um, I know you and I both have a lot going on today, is... It's just this idea of just even family and and just kind of thinking about that, making that long term plan for family, because, uh, you know, when I see Wendy, what I see is something that makes me very sad and it makes me very it, make, it just makes me really sad because I remember how excited I used to be when I would go on the Wendy Williams show yeah. and, and it was in this big, tall building in New York City. And I, I go up there and the people were super nice, respectful. Wendy was super sharp. And I just I just liked them. You know, I liked all of them and the, the producers, Taryn and Nicole and Charlemagne and all the people that were there. And it just it was almost like a like a distant family, you know, mm -hmm. and to see her going out like this, just I don't know. I remember the last time I talked to Wendy, it was the day before she was about to go to television and and then we were so we're sitting in this big tall new york tower and and we're doing it was just me and her for an hour on the radio and in radio the commercial breaks are super long so during the commercial breaks you really get a chance to talk and i remember the main thing we talked about was I was like, yeah, you're making this big move to TV. How do you feel? That's kind of crazy. And I remember her, you know, telling me she was looking forward to it. And I was like, are, are, are you worried that it might not work out? She said, no, I think it's going to be fine. And I'm sitting here thinking, I don't know if this TV thing is going to work. You got It get totally works for it her. It totally works. She <laughs> killed it. Like, the girl killed it. But but here was the part that really kind of, I remember feeling like, um, I didn't like it, honestly. I felt like... The documentary you didn't like? No, I didn't like the documentary, but I also didn't like her leaving radio because I felt like if she was leaving, she should she should, should have taken her people with her um, because she had a really good team in radio, a, a good, loyal group of people, you know, like Taryn and Nicole and Charlamagne, and there was a, a guy who was the DJ, I forgot his name, and they were good people. Um, I remember her husband would come in and out. I never really met Kevin. I talked to him on the phone once, but I never met him in person. Uh, and it, it seemed at that time it was like she was leaving in the, in the middle of chaos. Cause something what do you mean chaos? Um, there was some infighting going on, and oh. there, just some crazy stuff happening that led her, I believe, to walk away and just kind of be radio. like, be like, I'm out of here, right? Yeah. And when she left, she did. She left in the same way I felt like Sharpton left radio, which was like I'm leaving everyone behind. Like, like Charlemagne had to go back to South Carolina to do public access radio, like, believe it or not. Oh, he had to start over. Charlemagne the God, yeah, he had to go. He would call me every week wanting me to do that stupid public access show where wasn't nobody <laughs> listening except, like, you know, two people and a cow. And I did it. I did it. I did the interviews because I was like, you know what, if I was down and out and somebody had just dumped me the way Wendy dumped him, I'd want I'd want people to be nice to me. That's Honestly, I did it out of pity. And so to see him reemerge, <laughs> and, the, and it's, it's crazy because Wendy did the same thing. They both got kicked out and they came back, you know, with a vengeance because they're good, right? Charlemagne came back. He's now at the top of his game. Wendy, Diddy ran her out of town. She had to, I mean, Wendy had to go. And Wendy came back. Sean. Sean Combs, Sean her Puffy, Diddy, whatever. Because she remember she was the one that was the first one to really get into what what was going on with them Diddy parties. 
If you remember, Wendy was the first one to be like, "Oh, she was the tell-all of the Diddy part." Yeah, she was the one like, "I know what you did last summer." <laughs> like, oh, was, oh. yeah, yeah. So Wendy was making a lot of people upset in the hip hop world. So they booted. So she pretty much got ran out of town, had to go to Philadelphia, and worked her way back up and became the queen of New York. So to me, like they were just this awesome team, and I felt like she was leaving without her squad. And I think that it was like there's something about it's like if I leave my parents' house where I leave my family. It's one thing if I say, you know, we're leaving on good terms and we love each other. It's another thing if I leave out, like, in a frenzy, in a tizzy. Well, she was the number one show, right? And then she left to go to TV. And, I mean, I, I hear what you're saying, but I think sometimes to grow and to develop, you know, when you do one thing for such a long time, you, you want to put yourself in a new situation and see how you do. Mm. I mean, why not? Oh, yeah, let's go to television. Let's see how television works. I mean, it just, it's, it's you know, you don't want to be confined, but at the same time, you want to, you know, when your work is done, when everything is done and you're ready to move on, you say goodbye. It's okay to terminate sometimes. It's okay to say goodbye to you in this moment. It was a great experience and hello to you in another moment. But this moment is over. Like sometimes when it's time to go, it's time to go. Yeah. And it's okay. It's okay to say goodbye. Yeah, I think that I, I do agree 100%. It doesn't mean I, I hate think... you. It doesn't mean you don't have to end on sour terms. I think a lot of us in our community, I think we don't know how to terminate because termination is connected to such pain and argument and fighting and I hate you. No, termination could be thank you so much for the experience that we had. Thank you so much for this business opportunity. Whatever it is, goodbye. It's time to move on. Yeah, and and the problem yeah. with Wendy's termination is I did not feel like it was a healthy termination. Okay. It came off to me as hasty. It came off like, you know, like like I honestly think that when you get to that stage in life where you become vulnerable, you're better off being surrounded by people that have been with by your side for 20 or 30 years instead of people who just met you two years ago. And I think that if you are a mega star like <laughs> Wendy Williams, people assume you're extremely powerful. But what also can be true is that you're going to get used. You know, if you look at Do you what, think TV used her up? Um, I don't know what, I mean, I think the drugs and alcohol and all this other stuff. Well, that was going to happen at, regardless. Right. You, you look at another person you and I spent some time with, which is Kanye West. And look at Kanye. Kanye's walking around with half a billion dollars in his pocket, you know, just sort of walking around L.A. lost and confused and, you know, having his mental health issues. And there's nobody around him that has that ability to say, Man, you you need to we need to deal with this. You yeah, know, like you know what I mean? Like like I think and that's the thing, as much as people might want to criticize Kevin Hunter, Wendy's ex-husband, I think Kevin was one of those people that could be like, no, 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 we're not we 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 need privacy. We're gonna go deal with this personal issue. And instead of having this publicist who's been around a couple of years who's excited because she's know. making money working with a celebrity so so you're 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 intimidated you're because because you're not at that level when when people deal with you who don't know you who are not at your same level they will cater to you they're gonna say yes to whatever you want whereas that person who's known you 20 or 30 years who's been through with you through thick and thin they're gonna be like no i don't care how famous you are it's hard we're we yeah. gonna fix this and also i don't care if you don't have any money i care about you mm -hmm. and so i i don't think kanye has people like that around i think his mama was that person his mama's well, gone. She's now, been gone for a while. Right so. now, Kanye's acting weird. Right, I think Wendy. Um, she had a couple people like that. Uh, I know. I I can say this. I know personally. Very. I, I have very good relationships with a couple of people that work with Wendy, and I know. I really honestly believe that these people never would allow this documentary to be shot mm -hmm. and for her to be out here looking like this and have the world remember her in this way. Like, yeah, but I think. Um, I think Wendy Williams alienated people. Because the people who really seemed to love her, she was not nice to her team. She was not on this documentary. She's not nice to the people yeah. around her. Yeah. Like, she is, she's very downright just rude and insulting. Um, so I think that that is an issue. Um, I also think it's just, like, really hard. Like, what do you do when somebody around you um, has this mental health issue or addiction issue? Like, it just kind of makes people kind of run away from you. But at the same time, it attracts people to you who take advantage of you. Mm -hmm. So that's that's true. That's yeah, true. and you're right. You're right. I mean, I th and I think that that's something that I I don't know how she feels about this or she's understands this or not. But you have to be humble enough 
to really learn how to appreciate those people that are around you who might tell you about yourself if you get out of line or whatever, like, or you came, you know, I don't know. I don't know. I, I kind of feel like, I mean, I know everybody thinks celebrities are like big and all powerful, but, but you're very vulnerable. You're a human being. You're a human being. And she for sure is very vulnerable. I mean, she didn't have any money. She had to sell her clothes voice. Mm. She had to go through her closet and take most of the clothes out and lay it out so that she can sell it for money. And you know it's selling it for money for alcohol. She's selling that clothes for money so that she can keep her addiction going. You know that's what it's for. Yeah, who knows? I it's sad. It's sad. Well, I wish her the best. And um and uh, you know, there's not much else to say. But I I'm I, I'm gonna tell you, I'm I'm gonna if I do remember Wendy, I'm gonna remember the intelligent, capable Wendy. Um this this, well, this she just it this documentary did not show her that. It showed a very vulnerable side of her. She's got this big medical issue, her feet. Oh my God, the picture of her feet, boys, was terrible. She takes her wig off, you know, Black China visits her. She takes her wig off and her hair is just patchy. Her scalp is, it's just really sad to see her in this way. She just seems like so smart, sharp, powerful, very talkative, good personality. And you see her kind of like unraveling yeah. and losing it. She's losing it. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, what, what can you say? I mean, I wish you the best, and um, and I guess there's lessons we can learn. I don't know. My my lesson I say is we got to think about drugs and alcohol, what that does to our community. We also have to think about family, and yeah. how important family is. You know, even people, you, even family you're not related to, that matters as well. So be good to the people around you, so they can be good to you. So thank you all very much for hanging out with us. Uh, you you listen to Pillow Talk with Dr. Boyce and Dr. Alicia Watkins. Uh, if you'd like to get some resources from Dr. Alicia as well as a link to uh, that conversation she had yesterday with the, the therapist. They did a seminar on uh, on uh, who the F did I marry. Uh, it was really, really good, really, really deep. If you'd like for me to send it to you, just text the word love to 87948. Text love to 87948. We'll also send you links to our Love and Money Lab. Uh, we'd love to talk about things that relate to love and money. As you know, Dr. Alicia is a licensed therapist and a full professor of social work, and I'm a PhD in finance. And uh, and basically, we like to uh, have conversations about things that matter in our community. So God bless you guys. Uh, hit that thumbs up button on your way out, and we will see you soon. Take care now. Bye-bye. Peace.